Howdy folks and welcome to The Daily Coin. My name is Rory and today is Thursday, January the 7th, 2016 and I have the great honor and pleasure of welcoming to the show for the first time Mr. David Hageth from The Great Recession blog. David, how are you doing today? I'm doing good and thanks for the opportunity for a conversation. Well, I'm yeah. really glad that you're... I'm sorry? I said we've got a lot to talk about today. Yes, we do. We've got a lot to cover. There's uh, there's criminals. We are surrounded by criminals. So let's get to it and see what we can come up with. All right, let's go. And, well, uh, and you know, when you see people reelecting the folks who are doing nothing to, to help you out, then you really think, well, there's a lot of people that are just blind to what the Federal Reserve is doing. Yes. They're willing to believe what they hear because they don't want to hear bad news. And they want to think that, you know, this is being corrected and the right things are being done. But, you know, I got in a, a discussion with a guy who says, well, you can't predict these things. And, you know, we talk about that more, too. And, and I said, well, yeah, you can predict these things. You can predict them, you know, not in the sense that you can know everything that's going to happen or that you're pressured, but there's simply such an overwhelming number of things that are weighing against the economy right now. And the flaws are so deep that when you put those two, you know, major pictures together, it becomes inevitable that it's going to collapse now. And the size of changes that we need are just, they're enormous. They are enormous. Now I want to uh, kind of change gears here a little bit, David. And back in September, uh, Ambrose Evans Pritchard, who is one of the few mainstream media uh, journalists that I have any respect for at all. He writes for the Telegraph out of, yeah, out of the UK, and he wrote an article titled U.S. Interest Rate Rise Could Trigger Global Debt Crisis. And in that article, he actually went on to outline how uh, if the, according to the Bank for International Settlement, the Bank for International Settlement told the, the Federal Reserve flat out at least one time, probably several times during 2015, don't raise interest rates, otherwise you're going to cause enormous problems. You're going to cause huge problems within the uh, U.S. economy. And there was an article that was published uh, by U.S. News. And in this in this article, it was, it was published on November the 30th. In this article, there was a, a little nugget that I pulled out and wrote an article around it. And that was, the article is titled, Fed Moves to Limit Bailouts of Failing Firms. Emergency Lending Must Be to Aid Markets Only. And in this article, Janet Yellen it's, it, this is a quoting the article. Yellen noted that to replace rescue funds to individual companies, the 2010 laws, law outlines procedures for failing big financial firms to go through bankruptcy proceedings. The article is describing or is telling us that the Federal Reserve is no longer going to bail out these two big to jail banks mm -hmm. and that they are to go through bankruptcy proceedings. Okay. In September, uh, Ambrose Evans Pritchard is writing about the BIS coming out and saying, this is, this is going to fall apart. If you guys raise interest rates, mm -hmm. a few weeks later, Janet Yellen comes out and says, we're not going to help the banks. We're going to let them go bankrupt. Okay. Which I hope is true. Well, it's, that's good and bad because, right, right. because well, the people, bailout. the people that have accounts in those banks will go to the end of the line and they will lose everything. They may not lose a hundred percent. Now we have to go back to, and if we go back to 2011, 2012, uh, when Jeremy Stein fed head out of uh, Dallas, which is where Richard Fisher is from. He made that um, 
uh, he gave he delivered an address to the IMF and flat out said that Cyprus was the go forward model, and that and what happened in Cyprus, as you well well know, they closed. They had a bank holiday for at least eight business days, and then when they finally reopened those banks. They said, well, we're sorry, but we're taking somewhere around 50, 60 percent of all the accounts. It, you know, during that during that bank holiday, they kept telling them, you know, we're going to take this much from, you know, we're going to take X amount from accounts that have over 200,000 uh, equivalent U.S. dollars or and then they changed it to 100,000 equivalent U.S. dollars. And then when it finally was all said and done, they said, well, we're just going to take whatever we want and leave you with what we believe you you deserve and that was jeremy stein you know and they said they accepted that that was in 2011 2012 now we fast forward to today and what's happening and and everything that i just laid out right there and then you come to december the 16th when the federal reserve actually raised rates it was a, it was a slim you know 0.25 Okay, and now we come to Richard Fisher and his comments just this week mm -hmm. stating that, that the Federal Reserve did in fact create this overinflated stock market and that we are, that we are entering a quote digestive period. And it sounds to me like the Fed knows these so-called markets are crashing and will continue to crash over the next whatever time frame they have decided. And maybe this is the slow burn that Catherine Austin Fitz has discussed for so many years. Maybe this is it coming to an end. And what do you think about that? I mean, that's a, that's a pretty defined set of dots, in my opinion. I mean, what do you think about that? Well, this is why I, I told this, you know, one guy who then, you know, took and wrote me up in front of his audiences, not knowing what he was talking about, that these things are predictable. If you take it back to um, Evans Pritchard's, you know, comments that when the Fed raises rates, everything's going to fall apart. I think people don't understand the reason why everything's going to fall apart there. And so they go, oh, no, come on, a quarter of a percent, that's not going to blow the moon out of orbit. Well, yeah, it is. And there's a reason why that people aren't understanding and maybe, you know, maybe it just simply hasn't been said. But, you know, what I've been saying is it's not the quarter of a percent interest that's going to make everybody go, ooh, and run scared. It's the fact that the markets have been running in reverse for years where bad news was good news because every bit of bad news meant that the Fed was going to hold off a little bit longer on ending its stimulus and on raising rates, right? So you get a little little bad news and the market would actually go up, which was, you know, seemed totally weird. But it was going up because the big money was in what the Fed was doing, not in whatever's happening out there in the economy in general. So if the news was bad economically and it meant the Fed was going to keep the money pouring in, well, that was more significant. So the market would go up. Every time, bad news, good news. You know, bad news is good news, and you keep going up the ladder. Well, what happens on the very day when the Fed makes the decision to go ahead and start raising interest rates? Instantly, all of that flips over, and we step out of Wonderland. We step out of upside down world because now the Fed's made the decision. So, no longer is bad news good news because it doesn't mean the Fed is going to hold off longer and that it's going to keep doing its stimulus because it's already ended that. That's stopped. That's done. It's behind us. So now bad news is only bad news. Well, what happens when you make that reversal back into reality land and out of upside down world um, when you do it in an environment where you're loaded with bad news? And that's where I said this is so predictable because if you look at the economic environment right now, it's smothered with bad news everywhere. The whole world's gone into a global recession, which was something I also predicted on my blog clear back in the spring. I said by fall, it'll be evident that we're in a global economic collapse. And in that kind of situation, with the wars we got going on and the way they're heating up everywhere and just all the economic turmoil, 
there's bad news everywhere to be found. Now, I can't predict what piece of bad news is going to happen on any given day. But what I can do is when I see huge thunderstorms and uh, tornadoes whirling around, I can say there's going to be a lot of bad weather here. And if you're now in an environment where bad news is just bad news for the market, then the market's going to go down and down and down every time it hears that. So, yeah, I think it was predictable that when the Fed raised rates, things are going to turn back into right side up world where bad news is just bad. And that means the market's going to go down. And, you know, as you know, the market had a lot of levity and a lot of, you know, hot air that was beyond what the stock should be valued at. So it's got a long ways that it can come down. And that's and it's already started. Yeah. I mean, as, then, as we've seen, in, you know, just in these first three or four uh, trading days. Exactly. And the bad news turned out to be China. And, you know, where I base my predictions on the Great Recession blog is to say that, okay, I look at trends. I'm not looking at charts and when lines cross. I don't care about any of that. What I'm looking at is what are the news trends that we're reasonably confident are going to grow into the months ahead? And certainly one of them was the problem with China because that's predictable. China said it's going to slow down its economy. It wants to slow down its economy. Therefore, you know there's going to be bad news coming out of China. So China is one of the things that I said, you know, could be that bad news that hits right after the Fed um, decides to get off of its stimulus program. And there it is. And you look at the Chinese stock market. That's predictable what's happening there because they froze the market back in August when it started to fall. They suspended it. But we all know their economy kept going down, kept going down, slumping away, right? So here's the stock market suspended artificially up in midair. Well, the ground beneath it is slowly sloughing away, sloughing away for a half a year. Well, a half a year later, the ground beneath it is far below and the market's still suspended. So what's going to happen when they cut the suspenders? It's got to crash, you know? And China basically has put itself in a situation where its market either stays artificially frozen, in which case it's not a market at all, or if they finally do decide to free it, as they're talking about doing now, it starts immediately crashing as everybody bails out to try to get to where the economy is beneath them, right? There's a lot of airspace between where the Chinese economy is and where the market was frozen. But now Richard Fisher said, don't blame China. That's right, because the problem that we face. I mean, that's just the bad news. That's, that's just, just the bad news. Okay. Yeah, that's just the bad news that's going to hit. Just and if it wasn't symptom. China, it would be something else. It would be war in the Middle East. It would be the crashing prices of oil. My point is that there's, you know, a whole big gamut of bad news out there that can happen, and I can't predict which one's going to happen. I can just say there's so much that's going to. Those are just triggers. What Richard Fisher is saying is the reason this is going to fall is because the whole program is deeply flawed in the first place. We've artificially pumped up the stock market, he said, and we knew we were doing that. He used words like, uh, you know, juicing the stock market, engineering the stock market, engineering a, a recovery in the stock market. And he says, you know, and I don't know if this is just you know, the first of the rats leaving a sinking ship and he knows it's going down, so he's covering for himself, or if he's just one of the, you know, few somewhat honest people in the Fed, but he's, <laughs> I've, I've put this out to my colleagues. I told them, you know, don't get all wobbly on us when uh, the economy or the stock market starts to go down because it will. And what he's talking about is the inevitability. You pump it up full of all this hot air. You take that hot air out. It's going to go down. Yes. And uh, Craig, uh, Craig Hemke over at TF Metals Report, he wrote about the uh, death candle back, I believe it was in September. I'll have to, I'll have to look that up to, to be sure. But uh, he wrote about that and, and he pointed out he took a 25-year chart and showed exactly how what you were saying, uh, David, how it is predictable. And, and he, he said that back then, that it's happening right now. And now we, we fuel this fire with everything that you and I have just discussed. And the fact that the markets, the U S stock market, the Chinese stock market are both in pretty much in free fall. 
I mean, I think that I think they've they've had to stop. They've stopped the Chinese market twice this week, right. or halted halted trading altogether. Uh, crash again, you know, this morning. This morning, exactly. And yeah. I mean, that's what well, what, I, else, what I, else can be said about it? I mean, if you're if you have if you have you know stock in the stock market, or if you're in a four hundred one k or in an IRA or a private pension plan, these are about to get annihilated. Or am I, or am I wrong? Um, no, I don't think you're wrong. I mean, I've moved all of, we don't, you know, what we have in 401k is there's, you're limited on how much you can move. At least, you know, in most plans, your options are limited. But I certainly moved all ours out of funds that are related to stocks and move them into cash positions because even though that's not safe either, I find it, you know, a lot safer than stock markets. You can find a lot more volatility in stocks and in bonds other than U.S. bonds. I mean, eventually, U.S. if U.S. bonds collapse, that means the U.S. economy is completely destroyed, and in that case, all bets are off anyway. Um, you know, but you're limited on where you can move it. You can't buy gold in your 401k. Um, at least I certainly can't in, in either of ours. Um, so, you know, you're limited. Um, well, you can, you can move your 401k and roll it over into an LLC and then you can buy gold and silver from there and you can hold that at home. I mean, that's, I don't know that that's, that holds true in all 50 states, but I believe that it does. Um, cause the, the folks at, uh, perpetual assets, they, that's what they do. And it's, and I've, I've, I've interviewed uh, Will Lair over there in the past, and he's described in great detail how you can do that, do exactly that. So there, there, is, there is an option to get it to move it out to where you don't have to hold cash or to be in this nightmare that is unfolding right in front of us. And I want, I want to read this real, real quick, David, and, and get your take on this as well. This is from... Uh, this was written by um, Brandon Smith over at Alt Market, and the, he's quoting uh, Ben Bernanke from 2002, I believe. Yes, yeah, November 8th, 2002, in a speech at a conference to honor Milton Friedman on the occasion of his 90th birthday. And this is a uh, quote. This is quoting uh, Ben Bernanke. In short, According to Friedman and Schwartz, because of institutional changes and misguided doctrines, the banking panics of the Great Contraction were much more severe and widespread than would have normally occurred during a downturn. Let me end my talk by abusing slightly my status as an official representative of the Federal Reserve. I would like to say to Milton and Anna, Regarding the Great Depression, you're right. We did it. We're very sorry, but thanks to you, we won't do it again. That's exactly what's happening right now, David, or am I wrong? I mean, they, they came out, they set these policies into place. They have triggered now with this 0.25% interest rate rise, they have triggered exactly the same situation that occurred in 1928, 1929, and again in 1931 when everything started falling apart and then we and then we the 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 global depression occurred. It had, it started here in the United States, but it quickly um moved around the world. And now we have another Fed head coming out and saying we did it. We created this problem. Our policies are the reason that the United States economy is a lie and it's a joke and it's, and it's going to this, quote, digestive period doesn't sound very good to me. Or am I misreading this? I mean, Richard Fisher says, and I quote him, we front loaded a tremendous market rally. And then he goes on to say, I'm not surprised that almost every index you can look at was down significantly. 
And then he says it's got a lot farther to go. We had a tremendous rally, and I think there's a great digestive period that is likely to take place now and that it may continue. Basically, he's saying as this thing eats itself up. The, the metaphor that I've used from the very beginning of this, when they started with the bank bailouts and everything that's happened since, is what we were doing as we rolled debt over into bigger debts and tried to create astronomically bigger debt as a way of solving a debt crisis was it was like snow plows. They're designed to push, you know, to angle the blade and the snow goes off to the side so that the snap plow can keep going ahead. But we got the blade set straight and we're pushing the snow straight ahead by piling up more debt. Instead of shoving, shoving the debt off to the side and clearing it, we're creating bigger and bigger pile of debt ahead of us until it becomes this mountain of debt. And at some point, the snow plow gets to the point where it can't push the mountain anymore. Traction breaks, the wheels start to groan and everything comes to a stop. And that's where we are. What the Fed's plan was, was to keep rolling the debt over into bigger debt. Well, that's what we did throughout the Greenspan era. We created, we fueled an expansion of the economy by rapidly expanding the amount of debt. Well, hey, you can all have a good time and you can have a great party if nobody's paying for it, right? Right. Yeah. And so what they said is, well, just we topped out the credit cards. Now let's go find a bigger source of money and we'll borrow even faster and bigger than we ever did before. And it didn't create as much of a party this time. It barely kept us going because the snow plows are starting to grind down under a heavier and heavier load of debt. And now we get to the point where you can't push the mountain forward any farther. And that's right the moment at which the Fed pulls out the choke and kills the engine and the plow goes dead. You know, this little quarter of a percent increase, like I say, is huge because it puts us back in the world where now the stock market has only reality to look at. It just can't be looking at the moment for the Fed to save it. And the reality of this mountain of debt and of the bad news that's happening around it means that the stock market's got to go down. And you know, that's what Richard Fisher's saying. We created this. We, you know, we piled this mountain of debt ahead. We front loaded everything. Um, and now there's going to be a digestive period where we try to digest this debt. Well, it's way too much to digest, so it's going to be a lot worse than Fisher says. You know, Fisher thinks, well, maybe we're going to have a 20% market downturn. Well, yeah, that'll be the first jog down, but there's there will be plenty of others. Um, when a bear market goes down, one thing people need to realize is it doesn't go down in one big crash. You look at all the big crashes from you know 1929 onward. The market started turning downward before it crashed, kind of makes a rounded top, and then it goes over a cliff, and then it has a rally and bounces back up, and everybody's happy. Woohoo, we're done. Yeah. And then it goes over another cliff. You know, and these things take a year or, or longer, like the Great Depression did, before they even find their bottom. And that's the way this will be. There'll be a lot of big bounces down, and there'll be rallies back up where everybody says, see, we're over. It was just a 10% correction or whatever. But it's a train wreck. And just like when you wreck a car, bam, it's done. But when you wreck a train, it just keeps wrecking and wrecking and wrecking, you know. And the predictability is like you were kind of saying earlier you know, when we were talking, um, you look down the rails, you see the locomotive has jumped off the tracks. You don't have to be a wizard to know a train wreck is coming, even though the locomotive is the only thing that's off the rails. Right. Oh, so we saw the thing go off the rails. That means run. Get out of the way, because when a train starts to wreck, it keeps wrecking until every single last car has piled up. So and on that, a mile long train, that's a lot of wrecking. That's a it lot takes, of wrecking, and it takes and it takes a while for it to unfold, and that's where we're at that's, right now. That's right. And and you're you did a five part series, uh, David, uh, called uh, Apocalypse. It was it was the the Apocalypse series. And it That's started right. with Apocalypse Soon, the second coming of the Great Recession is near. And you published this, I believe, on December the 3rd. And I want to read the first paragraph of this because it really sums up everything that people need to, to take into account, in my opinion. And, and this is what it says. This is what you said. This is what you wrote. It was the second nuclear explosion, not the first. That ended World War II. And so it will be with the nuclear-sized 
economic disaster that first struck the earth in 2008. The second strike will be more, I'm sorry, the second strike will have greater consequences than the first and that nuclear bomb is about to go off with a relatively small detonator to set the reaction in motion. And that is what this will be, a reaction due to the potential energy stored up. With that said, and with everything that we've just been discussing, what do you see as the trigger point? Is it, is, are there derivatives that are currently melting down? Is it going to be the um, housing market? Is it, is it getting ready to fall off a cliff even further, I should say? Uh, because it's already, it's already showing signs of, of weakness and stall in, in certain cities and that, that it's in, in bubble territory. And what, what do you see as something that, that we, the average person, what can we look to and say, okay, something, something just happened right there. How can I, well, I need to, I need to do something. Yeah. Or, and that event is now past tense. Uh, okay. It was a very small trigger. And I, and I'm writing about this right now, putting together my next article in the Apocalypse series, which is my 2016 Economic Predictions, uh, tw uh, 2016 Year of the Apocalypse. The, the small trigger, the detonator that I mentioned, was just this little event of the Fed raising interest rates. Okay. And as a, the point that everybody misses in all of that is that it's not about a quarter percent interest. Big deal. We can we can all snarf that up and not be damaged by just the interest itself. But it's the fact that now we're past that point where where bad news is good news. Now you know if you're balancing your bank account and you accidentally put two dollars in the deposit column instead of in the withdrawal column. It's a $4 difference, not a $2 difference, right? Because instead of going $2 up on your balance, you should have gone $2 down. So the difference in where your balance is is $4. It's worse than just the $2 difference. Well, that's the way it is with the bad news, good news thing. When bad news was good news, it was you know $2 up in your account. Now the bad news is bad news the way it should be. It's $2 down. That's a $4 difference in what it does to your balance. So it's magnified. And that's where I'm saying the importance of bad news becoming bad news again is now all of it pushes the market down instead of pushing it up. And so even when it was pushing it up, it wasn't pushing it up because of all the problems that are built into the market. So when it starts pushing it down, the market's already to go down because of those problems. Are in it. It's going to go down quickly. So that's why I said that's the little trigger that triggers a reaction that quickly cascades into a nuclear explosion. And that's what we're seeing now. You know, little bit by little bit, the market started going down at the end of December, and now it's falling off a cliff. And how far it'll go um, before it makes its first bounce, who knows? But it's got a lot of bounces to come. There's a lot of wreckage to happen. And so in my predictions for 2016, what I'm looking at, as I said, I don't look at charts and where lines cross and all that kind of stuff. What I'm looking at is what are the trends in the bad news department that you can count on happening? Uh, you know, and just to give your listeners somewhat of a taste of it, obviously one trend is the news in China. Um, that's not a hard prediction to make. And so that's something you can hold on to and say, okay, I know this is going to happen, right? I know that China's engineered its economy to go slow, and I know that it held its stock market up while the economy continued to slump. So I know that its stock market has a long ways to crash. And I can see that our stock market and all the other stock markets in the world react quite a lot to that when it happens. So there's a lot of pounding going to happen from that direction. I know that uh, um, auto loans are have become ridiculous. Yes, We know the auto, auto industry crashed last time around when when the economy crashed. Well, since then, we've gone from this point where maybe one in 10 auto loans was six years or longer to where 50% of auto loans are six years or longer. And most auto sales aren't even sales, they're leases. So there's a lot of room there for an even bigger crash in the auto industry than the one we saw the first time because it's all more precariously perched. Just like we made loans crazy with the housing crisis when it happened, you know, when it was building up in 2005, 6, 7. 
um, with more and more ridiculous terms of credit. We've done that with auto loans. And so you've got this big overhead that doesn't have a very good basis of support on it. You know that could come down. And, you know, we've repeated the same mistakes that we have with housing where the biggest problem with housing you know what to me was the was the clue is i looked around and i said back you know in 2007 i said how are people affording all these mcmansions where's this <laughs> money coming from you know who who are all these rich people because they were building them all around me and i'm like i don't know that many rich people and i i realized well the way they're the reason they can afford it is because of these adjustable interest loans is a big part of it right they get in at an interest rate they can afford because they could never possibly afford to buy this house with real interest but with a teaser rate they can get in and they can minimally make those payments well in five years at the time ball except that everybody thought and believed well the price of houses is going to go up and therefore in five years i'll have so much equity even though i've paid down nothing that i'll be able to refi and i'll be able to lock in a good rate and if i can't i don't care the price has gone up so much i'll just flip the house and i'll take all that money i make and i'll use that for the down payment of the next one and i'll buy an even bigger one and on and on up the stairs it goes and the point i realized is oh well what happens if one day the housing prices stop going up and then the adjustable rate loans start coming due and you can't resell the house for enough to make that pay off all of a sudden the whole thing starts to collapse and unwind and that's exactly what happened well we've repeated all that so that can come down too i don't think it's going to start in housing this time i don't think it's going to start in auto loans i think that it's going to start in the stock market and that it's already started there but this is what i was predicting you know a few months ago is that it would start in the stock market this time because that's where we built up the biggest asset bubble last time we built it up in housing with ridiculous terms of credit there this time we created all this ridiculous credit and we used it to buy stocks and to buy bonds so the things that are going to crash first and worse are going to be the junk bonds and the stock market. And we've seen junk bonds starting to unravel. It's looking like a catastrophe unfolding. Uh, and uh, you know we're seeing that starting to happen in the stock market too. But as those things go down, banks get weaker, unemployment starts going back up, then people can't afford to pay their house loans. So then the housing market comes down again. People start walking away from the cars that never put a down payment on in the first place because we've repeated all of that ridiculous credit, um, r ridiculous credit terms. So they walk away from cars like they did the last time and the auto market goes down. So you see the whole thing go down again because all we did was push it straight ahead. We didn't do anything to deal with the structural problems that were underneath um, by, you know, basically not building an economy based on debt. Seeing this and, and what you've just described, David, is what I was pointing to or alluding to a moment ago when I was saying that, you know, Yellen, Janet Yellen has instructed the two big to jail banks to file for bankruptcy. And right. as they file for bankruptcy and their, their crony friends scrape the wealth off of the top of this uh, dead entity. It's been dead for 15 years. Mm -hmm. As they scrape that off, then they start taking the accounts of the people that have money in those banks because that's the only thing that's left. Yeah. And, they, and those people are pushed to the back of the line, right? Mm -hmm. Because that's the way that bank bankruptcies work. That's the way that they set the laws up to be in their favor. So they, so I think uh, my personal opinion is that the raise in interest rate, and they've, they've said they're going to do more this year. If they do, in fact, follow through with that, and we do see more interest rates throughout 2016, that is going to push them over the edge. Or or won't it i mean because that the next if there is a, another interest rate rise from the federal reserve mm -hmm. will that not push these guys to the brink of disaster you know i don't think that we're even going to be able to get to that point um peter schiff was was saying you know he's kind of a perma bear 
has been saying for a long time, well, the Fed isn't going to raise interest rates. The Fed oh. isn't going to raise interest rates. And I said, yeah, it is. The Fed's going to raise interest rates. Um, and the reason it's going to do it is because it desperately wants to prove that its program worked. I said, however, as soon as it raises interest rates and we step out of Wonderland and back into reality world, the whole thing's going to start going down. And I think now that they've made that switch, that it's going to go down faster than they ever imagined. And they're never going to get to that point where they have the ability to raise interest rates again. They're going to soon find themselves scrambling, hoping, you know, they're going to find themselves in this trap where they've got to lower interest rates again if they want to use their old model to save things. But they can't because they know if they lower them, that just admits their whole program caved in and didn't work. They're going to be in a real quandary. And I'm not sure what they're going to do. Maybe they're going to tell us we all need to go to negative interest rates like part of Europe has done where we'll charge you to keep your money in the bank and we'll get your money out of the bank that way by charging you interest on it for having it in there. Yeah. I mean, I and, and that's, that's already been discussed. Yeah. And I think that would be more likely than that they would actually increase interest rates, but they're going to have a lot of egg on their face no matter what, because they're not going to be back in a situation in March. I don't think where they can even consider raising rates. It's going to be a scramble to figure out what do we do with the disaster we've created? Um, you know, as Fisher said, well, we, have, we, um, he said, Front loaded was his words, this enormous rally in order to accomplish a wealth effect. Um, and he wasn't surprised to see it all come down once you stop putting that energy into it. And so he anticipated a 20% drop. Well, in a 20% drop, are, and he's a Fed official, is the Fed going to raise interest rates in the middle of that? Probably not. But what its program will be, I don't know if it, you know, gets money out of you, it's probably going to be from going negative and, you know, basically charging you to keep your money in the bank. Which, if you have money in the bank right now, shame yeah. on you. <laughs> That's yeah, all I happens, can say. What happens when <laughs> they do that? Well, if they go that route, well, then money leaves the bank in a hurry. So can they even do that? And why would you keep your money in the bank if they're going to charge you interest to have it in there? So they're, I don't know really how they're going to try to get their way out of it when it comes. That's their headache to figure out. You know, what I can see is that it's going down and why it's going down and you know, what, I, what I'll be talking about in my next article about the apocalypse is what are the trends that you can identify that are pretty clear for the upcoming year they are going to be putting pressure on the market. Well, that's good. I'm glad to hear that you're that – you're going to outline some of that because I think that a lot of people will be very interested in, in reading that. I know that I will. And I hope to have it up on the Great Recession blog um, probably by tomorrow. Okay. And we're recording this on uh, Thursday, January the 7th, 2016. And David, I'm, I'm happy to say that you're the my first uh, interview for 2016. And, and this has been awesome. We've been speaking with David uh Hageth of the Great Recession blog. And you and where can we find all your all of your great work at David? Okay. So that's the Great Recession dot info. And uh that's where I'll be posting the next um apocalypse article which is twenty sixteen economic predictions uh, the year of apocalypse. That sounds great. We'll we will certainly uh direct people towards that and it's been it's been a real pleasure speaking with you, David, and I certainly appreciate all of your time today. This has gone on much longer than I ever anticipated, but it's been it's been really great because uh, uh, you are a wealth of knowledge, and and I look forward to uh, speaking with you again in the future. Well, thanks. I've enjoyed it. Well, we will talk with you soon. I'll let you get back to your afternoon, and I certainly appreciate it, David. All right. Bye.